Hey guys, we are live. Welcome to another live at five session. And this one's really cool. It's entomology, AKA bugs, insects. Y'all know what that is. So um, we are live y'all welcome. I'm Anna Rebeck, social media strategist for the LSU Ag Center. And today we have assistant professor Nathan Lord with us today. Thank you, Nathan, for being here. Yeah, no problem. Um, can you talk about, you know, what you do and how long you've been with the Ag Center and everything and your research? Sure. So I will have been at LSU two years in June, so almost two years. Okay. And I am, as you said, I'm an assistant professor. And so I'm uh, one of the instructors for a few of our classes in the Department of Entomology. And so I teach insect taxonomy, which is basically how to identify insects. Um, I teach a little bit of general entomology, the different parts of insects, the different groups and uh, I've taught um, the undergraduate entomology course as well. In a research capacity, my group focuses on understanding the role of color and color vision in insects. So we often think of vision and color in human terms, but insects can see very differently than we do. And I'm trying to understand how they see, um, what colors they can see in, and why many insects have the colors on their bodies that they do. Okay. Um, yeah, so in addition to that, I'm also the director of the Louisiana State Arthropod Museum, which okay. is a state resource. It's also a, a departmental resource, and it's basically the library of insects for the state of Louisiana. And uh, it's right here in the Biological Sciences Building on LSU's campus in Baton Rouge. Oh, that's really neat. Is that open to the public when COVID is not happening? <laughs> so yes and no. Um, it is mostly a research collection that's meant to serve as a reference for our faculty and staff, our graduate students, our uh, parish agents. Um, but sometimes we do tours or various trainings for groups and those are more or less just contact one of us and we can see what we can do. You're gonna have to um, send us some photos for, for the uh, social media to start posting from the Arthropod Museum. I think that'd be really cool. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So I wanna talk to you, like today we're gonna go over a few different things with you. You have a lot to talk about. But uh, first off, like what kind of research are you working on right now? Yeah, so right now I work on this family of beetles. I'm a, I specialize in beetles. And furthermore, I specialize in um, the names of beetles and one of my jobs is to travel around and collect and describe new species of beetles and other insects uh, and the group that i work on now are called the jewel beetles and they are called that because unlike most insects that are brown and small these jewel beetles can get quite large and they are iridescent meaning their color shifts and changes as you look at them um, one of the biggest pests of hardwoods in North America is the jewel beetle, the emerald ash borer. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of ash tree as a commercial product in Louisiana, but the rest of the U.S. does, and uh, this pest has been causing major, major damage to our local ash po populations since the early 2000s. And so part of what I'm doing is looking at uh, how these beetles are finding the trees, how they find mates, and trying to figure out if their jewel coloration is important for signaling and attraction. That's cool. Okay. Uh, do you have any in your office by any chance so people could see? Uh, I don't. I don't actually. A lot of them are in my my uh, my home lab where I spend most of my time working now that we're in the, the time of COVID. So yeah, most of my jewel beetles that I'm working on are on my dining room table, which my wife really loves. So yeah, we'll put up some images later. I'll show people because yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I wanted to get in. So our, a lot of our horticulture agents are receiving questions right now on different types of bugs out there in Louisiana. Right. And so if you could kind of discuss some of the ones that I gave you beforehand. So like the first one right now, a really big one is stinging caterpillars, like the ones we find falling out of live oak trees and things like that. Um, how, right. You know. Yeah. So stinging caterpillars. Um, there are lots of caterpillars. So a caterpillar is a sort of a generic term for the immature stage of a lepidopteran, which is a butterfly or a moth. And um, lots of, most caterpillars are totally harmless. Uh, 
but there are a handful that can cause severe irritation and possibly allergic reaction to humans. Okay. Yeah. So in general, my advice would be if you see a caterpillar that has lots of apparent spines and spikes yep. or is super hairy, I probably wouldn't pick it up. Uh, mostly because you just never know. Um, there are four of the baddies that we have in Louisiana. And, um, you know, if you guys are watching, if you Google these or, or maybe Anna, you could pull up an image. Uh, right now. You have to watch out for the first one is the saddleback caterpillar. And it's pretty tiny, but it's got some very distinctive color patterning. It has a nice brown dot right in the center of its back. It also has these four pointed bumps, uh, two on each end of the caterpillar. And you can see that on those pointed bumps and then along the side, it has these nice set of spines. Um, the caterpillars that do sting you do it a couple different ways. Some of them have what are called urticating hairs, and it's essentially a lot like little tiny needles or fiberglass, if you have ever put in fiberglass or insulation in your home. Um, it can just get into your skin and be a, a, a physical aggravator. Other times, though, there are fines that can actually inject a little bit of a toxin, which is an irritant as well. Mm, okay. Yeah, so that's so the saddleback is one of them. Uh, the IO moth is a very, very pretty large silk moth we have here in Louisiana. It's yellow. Uh, it has bright, big eye spots as an adult moth. Um, but that, again, looks like it might hurt. It's, it's, it's sort of pale yellow, and it's got a nice red and white stripe down the side, and it's covered in these big tufts of, of spines. Um, the buck moth is another one. I and have that's also, that's also, yeah, that's also a silk moth. And as you can see, you just probably wouldn't want to touch it, right? Um, and that is also a, a silk moth in the, in the family Saturnidae. And it looks just like that. And then the last one that looks a bit different uh, is the pus moth. And that looks like a big clump of yellowish hair that, that just crawls about. So in general, if you touch one of these, and you experience discomfort, um, you're probably gonna be fine. Um, what you can do is you can take some tape and put it over the area that got stung and pull it off. And what you're trying to do there is remove any of the hairs that are stuck in your skin. You wash with soap and water, um, and then you can use, just to decrease the swelling, you know, an ice pack, or you can make a mix of baking soda and water, or use calamine or aloe. You can take an antihistamine to sort of reduce the reaction. The one thing you have to be concerned about, though, is if you are someone who is highly reactive to insect stings in general, uh, that you don't go into anaphylactic shock or have trouble breathing. So if you do have um, severe reactions, you know, you need to go see a doctor right away. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, we've had a lot of questions on stinging caterpillars. Mm -hmm. um, now Jennifer's asking questions, so we might skip ahead. She's really interested in starting a collection. So this talk should be great. If you could talk about some first steps in collecting butterflies specifically, but you know, you wanted to talk today about how can people create an insect collection at home? How can they start that, especially right now when people have time and they have kids at home? Right. Yeah. So I think actually this is a really fun thing you can do right in your own backyard. And so right now I'm teaching a lab on insect taxonomy where all of my students uh, should be anyway, collecting insects right now for their, for their part of their grade. And at first glance, it's maybe a little bit harder to do now that we're stuck here, but there are so many insects right in your own backyard. So yeah. So um, I can provide a couple of links, but if people are actually serious about knowing what's in your own backyard, um, you just go dig around, whether it's flipping rocks or turning over logs, there are going to be insects there, whether it's checking your porch light at night, uh, there will be, there are all sorts of insects in Louisiana that come to lights. Um, you can design all sorts of different traps out of very common household material. You can take an old two liter bottle and cut a cut a hole in the uh, square in the side and just stick in some fruit and let it 
decay and sort of get smelly in the sun and all sorts of different insects will come into that fermenting fruit. So yeah, so there are lots and lots of ways to collect insects. And then, so your next question might be, okay, now that I have insects or I've found them, what do I do? And exactly, so what do you do with them? Yeah. I remember when I was a little kid, I raided my mom's sewing kit and for her sewing needles. And I looked up pictures online of making an insect collection like a professional and, and pinning insects. And yeah, you can do that. Um, in some of these supplies though, are actually not all that expensive. And there's one company uh, that sells a lot of entomologically related goods it's called BioQuip. And they actually offer a beginner insect collector kit where it's got everything you need to build one and a little manual on how to do it. And I think it's a little less than $50. Um, but yeah, it includes insect pins. And so it talks about when you, how to kill an insect. And the easiest way, honestly, is just to put them in a Ziploc bag and put them in your freezer. Um, and then you can pin an insect into a uh, foam so that they are spread or you can, they can be displayed or you can move them around without breaking them. And yeah, and then you are essentially doing a survey of what you have. Lots of people are birders and they're like sitting out or sitting on their deck and seeing how many different species of birds come to their yard. And it's no different with insects, except that there's a heck of a lot more insects to, to see. Um, you know, I think we have 15,000 or more species of insects in Louisiana, uh, just in the state. So yeah, and then when it comes to identifying, there are lots of resources online. Um, one of the best ones is iNaturalist, where if you find an insect and you don't want to collect it, you can take an image of it with your cell phone camera and post it to this website. And you are actually collecting scientific data about the distribution or where, where this insect is found, time of year, time of day sometimes. And there are other tools. Uh, there are apps on your phone, like the Seek app, where you can uh, take a picture and using modern computer algorithms, it can actually help you identify. Uh, one of the questions I got is how long do you have to freeze them? That's a good question. So if your freezer is cold, and that's usually at minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to keep things frozen, um, or um, you should probably let them freeze for at least an hour. And the reason I say that is just to be on the safe side. Insects are very hardy creatures, and sometimes I have frozen insects and not done it long enough and we go to pin them and then they sort of reanimate and come back to life. And so you don't want that. So yeah, so maybe give it at least an hour, although less time is probably sufficient. I'd say an hour is a good bet. Okay, fair enough. And guys, I added the uh, link to iNaturalist in the comments. So y'all check that out if you're interested in how to ID bugs. Uh, got another question about uh, someone that has green and Carolina ash on your property, should you be concerned? Um, it depends on where you are. So as far as I know, the we have intercepted emerald ash borer beetle only in the extreme northwest part of the state so far. Um, do we expect it to spread further into Louisiana? Yes, we do. But because our ash concentrations are less than a lot of other states, we expect that spread to be much slower just because there's a lot of distance in between those food sources. Um, unfortunately, if you have emerald ash borer, there isn't a lot you can do. But what you can do is you can just monitor the health of your trees in general. And if you think you might have a sick tree, call your arborist, call your local parish agent, and uh, people can come out and diagnose what's wrong with your, with your tree. Fair enough. I'm sure you get a lot of questions from the agents, correct? Yeah, to, to help to help assist with identifications, uh, we often do um, help with that. So whether it's by sending in specimens to us here in Baton Rouge or whether it's over the phone or email, um, more or less every day or every other day at least, we are helping us, you know, assisting our parish agents with identifications, whether it's just to confirm something that they've already identified or to provide additional support. So, yep. Fair enough. 
And we have a few more people logging in. So could you kind of go over again, like how to create that insect collection um, at home right now? Yeah. So if you want to do it quasi professionally, there are insect kits you can buy. Uh, but to start with, um, you know, if, if you are interested or your kids are interested, I just say go out there and and collect insects. You can use fishing nets if you have a, a, a aquarium, a little tiny green fishing net. Um, yeah, I'd put them in Ziploc bags or old pill containers or whatever you want and um, freeze them or put them in rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, and then you can pin them. Now, there are fancy scientific insect pins for this purpose, but, you know, in a pinch, a sewing needle would work. Um, and that's mostly to put the insects at a, a different level so that you don't touch them and break them to keep them sort of preserved. And there are all sorts of boxes you can put them in. Um, or you can just take a more or less make a digital collection where your collection isn't the specimens themselves, but they're images. And lots of people do that as well. Oh, that would be cool. I didn't even think about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we'll move on because um, I think that's a really good good intro uh, for, for kids, especially to do right now. So y'all hear that, like take your kids outside, get them to collect bugs, be cool kids. Cause that's what I did as a kid too. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about, so some of the agents have been receiving a lot of questions on um, the leaf footed bug versus the assassin bugs, like how to tell the difference, you know, what's, how do you do that? Right. So first question is what is a bug, right? And so a bug is a common name for an insect right? But a bug is also a specific name for a group of insects. And so, again, we're not the best. Humans aren't the best at always being clear with our words. But we have this group called the, the true bugs, and those are also known, their scientific name is the hemiptera. And they're called that uh, because they have a very distinctive wing, and they have very distinctive mouth parts, and their mouth parts are a beak and the beak can either be short and very pointy or the beak can be very long and straw-like and they're one of the more diverse groups of insects on the planet it's the, the fifth largest order um, and they feed either on plant tissues by sticking their beak into the plants either the leaves or the stems or they feed on other usually insects by sticking their beak into an insect or you, your hand, if you try to grab them, and um, sucking out the fluids. So yeah, so here in Louisiana, we get two bugs, and you can see from the infographic on the right, um, that look similar. Uh, and you can see the one that has the box that says yes, it's sort of this generic stilty insect with thick antennae and a red body. And then you've got another one to the, to the right of that, and with the no on the box that looks similar. The problem is, is that these are immatures, and the immatures are red uh, as a signal to not, don't, don't eat me, uh, and they're often found on plants. One of them is good, and one of them is bad. Um, and so on the left, you have leaf-footed bug nymphs, and that's the family Coreidae, or the leaf-footed bugs. And those can be um, destructive to vegetables or fruits or other crops they eat plant matter. The other one is, is uh, in this case, the milkweed assassin bug, and it's called the assassin bug because it is a predator and it is beneficial in that it eats a bunch of the garden pests that are found on your plants. And so this, is, this graphic shows if you find a bunch of these little red guys and they're all clumped together, uh, it's probably a leaf-footed bug because they do tend to aggregate as immatures um and they also have that well the reason they're called leaf footed bugs is if you look on the back legs uh the bottom part of their leg is expanded it's flattened and expanded and that's the leaf shape so if it has that and they clump together it's probably the one that you should just knock off your plant and squish step on uh but if it doesn't have those flared legs uh and is found just singletons or ones and twos, and it's probably your uh, another family of, of bug that is beneficial and likely eats the ones that you don't want. 
thank you for that answer because people ask that question all the time during this time of year and um, that was really really helpful <laughs> we appreciate it yeah um, we have a few questions from everybody over here so we got one from Melissa asking what can you do to get rid of buffalo gnats buffalo gnats right um buffalo gnats are they've got a, they go by a couple names here in louisiana um uh, they're also called black flies is the okay. more common name or the turkey gnats and so what can you do to get rid of them and the short answer is not much just wait uh and we're almost there so they are uh in their flies meaning they only have two well-developed wings for flight. Most insects have four. They're tiny. They're a millimeter and a half to two millimeters. And you can see from the image there that they sort of have this humpbacked appearance. And they're usually black to, you know, a dusky gray. Um, the immatures live in aquatic habitats. And normally the immatures live in faster moving bodies of water, which is why their occurrence in Louisiana over the past decade has been sort of odd because we don't have a lot of fast moving water in Louisiana. That's you know the definition of a bayou is a slow moving body of water that opens to the Gulf. But we don't have the typical habitat for these black flies or turkey gnats. Um, but what we're seeing is you see about mid-April, once it gets a little warmer, this emergence of all of these flies and it gradually fades away once the temperatures stay, get to consistently above 80 degrees every day. So as soon as the weather gets a little warmer and we're going to hit 80 degrees, uh, they become less and less of a problem. So their bites, um, oftentimes people will say, wow, you know, when a mosquito bites me, I might welt up and it, it hurts and it itches, but they do bite. And this bite usually impacts people a bit differently. Um, they bite us because the females require blood for the development of their eggs. So only the females bite and they do, they're also called the turkey gnats because they have a strong preference for birds. Um, and the reason it itches differently is because in their saliva, they've got a couple of different chemicals um, that affect us in different ways. And so oftentimes people will, if they react, will welt up. I definitely react where if I get bit usually on your neck or your face when you're outside uh, before dusk, it hurts and, and they can actually last for a couple of days. Um, but in terms of other than being a nuisance to us, they're not that large of a concern, but they are a decent concern if you have chickens or poultry or birds mm -hmm. um, and they can actually cause the death of your birds if too many of them feed on your birds and they essentially will exsanguinate which means sucking the blood dry so yeah you don't want that uh, the best thing you can do is just make sure that you're watching your animals and you have screens up and so that they can't get hit too hard by large numbers of turkey nets and guys i just added a link to our article that we have on um, from the ag center so it's in the comments and uh, we're getting a question from L.L. Paz. What kills leaf miners? Um, she said she's having issues. Horticulture oil is not working. So if you could kind of talk about the leaf miner, because we've been getting, you know, a lot of questions on like the tomato leaf miner, you know, citrus leaf miner. Sure. So um, leaf miner, again, is a, sort of a common term for any insect that, and it's usually the immature stages, will rather than chew on the leaf they will get in between the two layers of the leaf and mine their way through and you can typically diagnose that by looking at the leaf and seeing these uh, sort of translucent tunnels and so yeah so the, the one of the worst pests we have here is the uh, tomato leaf miner and it's got a funny name it's tuta absoluta is the actual <laughs> latin name. Um, and so tomato leaf miner, tomato pinworm are, are common names for that. And it essentially is, if you were to see the adults, the most boring brown moth you can imagine. Uh, they don't eat just tomatoes, though. They also feed on other, other 
uh, crops in the nightshade family like uh, potato and eggplant and, and tobacco and things like that. But you're right. So some of our agricultural pests are problems because they've been treated with pesticides for so long that they can start to develop over resistance. And so there are a number of different strategies. Yeah, that's typical leaf money damage there. There are a number of different strategies and insecticides you can use um, to try different things. So for the vast majority of, and again, this is not my area of specialty, so um, I'm sure many of my colleagues have will have far better suggestions, but uh, for a lot of the insects you're gonna find in your home garden, a generic insecticide is, is probably sufficient. But in extreme cases where you are growing lots of crops, um, you can try things like Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis or uh, orthene, which is acephate, or seven, which is carbaryl. Uh, there are a couple other ones, TTO and malathion. So there are a number of different pesticides you could try um, to get rid of them. So you all hear that. Leaf miner is something that we've all had at one point or another. Um, yeah, and like uh, the, this one also has a bunch of names, the corn earworm, uh, tomato fruit worm, cotton bowl worm, you know, sorghum headworm. It's all the same species of Helicoverpa zea, and that's also another one that has become resistant. And so another, another strategy that we often talk about is IPM, or integrated pest management. And what that means is, in addition to just spraying, uh, involving other strategies as well. For example, mechanical, right? You might plant different crops uh, adjacent to one another. You might do physical removal of infested crops, uh, you know, and you might manage a bit differently, not just relying on spraying or insecticides. That makes sense. We've got a question from Austin on your research. You said that jewel beetles are iridescent when talking about your research. What does that mean? And what is the process for identifying and naming new species of beetles? Yeah. Okay. So uh, iridescence is basically what happens when uh, the color shifts depending on the light or the viewer. And so if you think of a lot of birds are iridescent, um, if you look at the inside of a shell, that's sort of like an opal or a, the actual opal, uh, an oil slick on the road, a, a bubble that you blow, uh, um, you know, as a kid in the outside, those are all iridescent and the colors shift. And um, it's done because of uh, how the structures are and some physics of light. Um, but yeah, so that's, it's beetles in this case that, that, aren't one color. They, they can bend, they can look blue or green depending on how, what angle you're looking at them. And they use that to their advantage actually as, as camouflage, believe it or not. Although, um, you know, humans don't think of that as, as camouflage. And then the second part, what's the process for identifying and naming new species? So that's a good question. Uh, and while I often get, do you get to name stuff? And, and the answer is yes, I do. Um, so yeah, so what you essentially do is these people are normally called taxonomists and say I get a beetle in my yard and I want to know if it's new. Well, first I have to identify it as best as I can. And that often means going through all of those ranks that we learned in grade school. Um, you know, King Philip came over for green spaghetti, kingdom phylum class order, family genus species, and you find out or try to do your best to get it down to the lowest level. And so say it was a ladybird beetle and I got it down to the genus Harmonia. I would then have to use my resources or the collection here to figure out, well, how many species of Harmonia are in Louisiana or in the United States or in the world? Um, and then I would have to figure out and prove that it's not any of the species that we know about. And that can be from using their DNA, that can be from looking at their morphology, that can be from dissecting them. And then once you do that, you have to describe the insect. And there are rules, uh, it's called the code of no zoological nomenclature that you have to follow. Uh, you have to pick one specimen as the specimen that is the example that will persist for forever for what this new thing is. 
and then you have to publish it and, and write it up, and where you publish it has, has a bunch of rules too. But you do get to name it, so. That's cool, what have you named so far? Um, yeah, so I have named a handful of species. Um, actually, before I got this job here with my predecessor, we were in Costa Rica, and right outside of the research station, we collected a very strange beetle. Uh, and it has all these big spines on its cheeks and probably uses it to like spear little other little insects. And we called that uh, Leptochromus la selva because we were at the research station la selva, which is Spanish. Oh, yeah, which is Spanish for the jungle. I've named uh, species that tell you something about them. So Derftaphrus hoplites okay. uh, is, is Greek and that means armored. And so it's it's a very well uh, thickened armored beetle, and you can name them after people too. My my wife and my family are are waiting for their patronym, so maybe someday. <laughs> I bet they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I have, I found a photo of you uh, with with your beetles because um, I just wanted people to see at least. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so that's me in London. That's the British Museum of Natural History, or the, the house that Darwin built, as they call it. And those big beetles are uh, examples of these large, large jewel beetles. Uh, those occur mostly in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and that's what one of my master's students, his name's Abel, he is working on uh, using color as brand new ways of identifying things. And so color can be confusing, but it can also be very important as a signal. And so I was over there um, looking to see what, what specimens they had to bring back to study. That is super cool. Uh, Hillary's asking, where in the Baton Rouge area would you say you can find the most diversity of insect life? That's a good question. Uh, and it depends on how you want me to answer it. So surprisingly, um, you're, the soil beneath our feet has probably the most diversity. And so um, we oftentimes will go collect leaf litter or wood and sort of filter it through this process, this funnel, and over time extract these insects. And in those samples, you will find so many insects. But the problem is, is that they're very tiny and you need a microscope to see them. Um, in terms of Another collecting method that gets a lot of insects or shows a lot of diversity, uh, your porch lights or uh, the big mercury vapor lights that are in uh, large parking lots, shopping, shopping center parking lots, attract a lot of insects. But in terms of areas, I would tend to think that the most natural areas are probably the best. And so like when we go on collecting trips for class in the Baton Rouge area, we often go to Burden gardens uh, right there off the highway and it's a fairly large area and the reason is because there are just there's more diversity more types of plants and so the more you can get to areas that have lots of different types of plants you're going to find lots of different types of insects sadly burdens closed right now but hopefully yeah. you know in the future mm -hmm. um but so you're doing something you said with your undergrad class where you've challenged your lab to go out and collect insects. Is that what you're doing right now? Uh, this is actually my graduate class. Oh, okay, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so normally they have to make this big insect collection. And when we are not on social distancing and, and stay at home orders, you can go and you can collect and you can be at school and, and identifying, but now it's a little hard. And so we have a little challenge going right now where they can still use all the methods they want, but I want to see if I can collect as much or more diversity than they can. And so the limits on me are I can only use a tiny little hand net as a tiny little handle. I get one type of UV bulb to set outside my porch and I can only collect in my backyard. Ooh. And, um, you would be really surprised to know how many different types of insects there are right in suburban Baton Rouge. And, you know, I live right near campus. So right here you can collect, um, I think, you know, over the course of a couple of days, 40 or 50 or 60 families of insects and 10 or 12 orders. So that's, that's a decent amount of diversity 
um, just for your own backyard. I'm so impressed. Might, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, we might expand it and do a sort of a backyard backyard bugs public uh, study. So we'll see. Okay. Okay. Um, Toby Blanchard, I happen to know her. She's my boss. Do you have some bug related activities parents can do with their kids during the stay at home order? I do. I have a couple of fun ones. Okay. So um, oftentimes we think of termites as being really bad, right? And they, and they are, if they're the wrong type, um, you know, in, in Louise, we normally divide termites into two types, uh, dry wood termites, which eat drier wood and usually aren't a problem for our homes. And then the not dry wood termites, the subterranean termites, like the, like the ones that do eat our home. Regardless though, chances are somewhere in your yard, you can find termites. And one fun thing is if you grab a couple of the termites, and you put them on a piece of white paper and you go grab any ballpoint pen that you have um, and draw a shape, draw your name, draw, if you want to be a jerk, draw a circle. Uh, and what the termites will do is they will smell that pen ink and they will get on the trail and they won't get off of it. And the reason is because there's a, there's a chemical in ballpoint pen ink that is very similar to, um, uh, trail pheromone that termites use that they lay down in order to signal other termites this is the path home or this is the path to food and so yeah you can draw a circle and the termite will just get on that circle and go around and around and around um, yeah and there are all sorts of like I mentioned earlier um, if you are out and you've got your cell phones and are taking pictures there's this app that I really like that I actually use in class sometimes it's called seek s-e-e-k and it's done by iNaturalist and you can download it and it's not just for insects, it's for anything. There's, you can, I used it to figure out what type of grass I had in my front yard. St. Augustine, just in case you were curious. Um, yeah, and you can use it to see all the weeds you have. So if you are confused at the garden store about which weed and feeds the best, well, you should probably know what weeds you have. Uh, and they're not always as obvious as, as clover. And so, yeah, this app, uh, you just turn, you turn it on and it opens up your camera and you hold it in front of something and it will tell you to the best of its ability what it is. And as you move it, it will get a better view and can say, yeah, this is, this is clover, or this is a, you know, a pine tree, or this is a dog, right? And so that's sort of fun too. So you can go explore your backyard like that. I just put that link again in the comments, guys, if y'all wanna go to iNaturalist and look at it a little bit more. Uh, we're getting a question, another question from Austin. Uh, about beetles. He said, thank you for answering. Can the specimen that's used as the standard change? For example, if a more exemplary, exemplary specimen is found that better exhibits the identifying feature of the species? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it can change technically, but it's, it's, it's not supposed to. So when I find something new, I, it's called the holotype, and it's the one specimen, it's the one example. And that is given a special label and it goes in a special cabinet and only some collections are allowed to have them and they're, they're, they're kept because we need to know that that is the thing that I'm referring to. Well, sometimes accidents happen. Um, so for example, in, in the, the World Wars, a lot of different museums were bombed and a lot of these critical specimens were lost for forever. In those situations, uh, an authority, someone that's an expert on this group, can actually sort of be a detective and find other examples of that that were either collected by the same person, by studying the handwriting, or from the same spot on, on the planet. And using the description that, that I talked about you have to write, they can actually designate a new one. But that's rare, and it shouldn't happen. Uh, we try not to, but we do have rules in case you can. Uh, can I answer a few of these that I see? Uh, sure, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, so I've got one from Tessa and Zoe. Um, do any insects have live young? And yeah, some do, right? So a lot we think of insects as they sometimes, most of them lay eggs, but we can have live birth too. Um, cockroaches are one of those that can sometimes do that. And they can actually, uh, the eggs hatch inside and they can give birth to live insect babies. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. Caitlin's asking, what is your favorite insect? Hmm. 
was my favorite insect, the one that pays the bills. No, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think I, I would right now, I'd say the jewel beetles. But if I had to study another group of insects, I think I would study the praying mantises because those are really cool. I actually know a guy in, in Cleveland, Ohio, that studies, he's the world expert on praying mantises. So. Cool. Yeah, yeah. They're, uh, we've, we've gotten travel all over the world and collect them, and he's always showing me crazy, crazy praying mantises. So it'd probably be those, but I like the beetles. The beetles are awesome. You were telling me, so guys, he was talking one time, we were doing an interview, and you were telling me that like the, the beetles' wings can actually be used as like jewelry and like for other different types of things, not just jewelry. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a there's a jewel beetle that comes out in large numbers in Thailand, and you can actually buy them online. Lots of people do for for arts projects, and so I've I don't uh, I actually do have one. Here's a little jewel beetle wing, right? And so this is what it looks like, and you can maybe see as I if I move it around here. This is a horrible example, but as I move it, you can see that it's green to blue. You can maybe kind of see that. Oh yeah, and you it, can see it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is the uh, the the front pair of wings and these are what makes a beetle a beetle that that they're not uh used for flight they're used for protection like a shield it's kind of like the same consistency as your your fingernail and so yeah people will make uh art or jewelry out of these and so you can you can buy them on on etsy that's that's just pretty cool i just thought that was unique um mm -hmm. Stephen was asking, what was the name of the app you were referring to? Yeah, it's it's Seek, and it's by iNaturalist. So you just go to the App Store, or Google Play, and type in Seek, and uh, that's it. Caitlin said, what are the jewel beetles' defenses? Yeah, so jewel beetles are awesome because they do a lot of stuff. Um, some jewel beetles do have chemical defenses. They can produce toxins that are not tasty to their predators, which are usually birds and monkeys. Um, and um, oftentimes though, the jewel beetle's best defense is it is one of the best flyers and they are just extremely fast and they're very, very hard to collect. And so in addition to being a hard, chunky beetle, um, they're very elusive. And we're finding out now, although it's not very uh, sensical that this bright iridescent coloration, if you're not a human and you've got other visual uh, system of a bird, you see like a bird does, that it actually is camouflage. They blend in because the jewel beetle shell scatters light as opposed to uh, focusing. So if you think about if any of you guys are, are, I don't know if they have them anymore, old enough to remember roller rings where that always had a, a disco ball in the center, right? Uh, that disco ball scatters light everywhere. And that's what draws our attention, not the actual disco ball at the top of the ceiling. So that's sort of what they're doing. Megan's saying we make Mardi Gras masks. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So this is something that uh, that's that's Megan. She's a she's a graduate student in our department, and the entomology club here at LSU takes those jewel beetle wings and they make Mardi Gras masks with them, and they, as a fundraiser for our club events and activities. So I know that they sold some this year. We take them to a couple of our meetings and. And I don't actually do, I'm not very artsy or artsy. Yeah, but, but she is, and she made some awesome, awesome masks. And so, yeah, those are, those are really good. We might find a way to get them online or something to, to make them more available, but they were, they were really cool. Yeah, that is super cool. Okay. Uh, what other, the research you're doing right now, does it require you to travel a lot? Obviously not during COVID, but like, do you do a lot of traveling? I do. Um, yeah, we were supposed to be, our, my whole lab group was supposed to be heading off to, to Vietnam for about a month uh, here pretty soon, although obviously that's not happening now. But yeah, we get to go uh, travel quite a bit, and that's one of the best parts of, of my job, in my opinion, is that we often have to go to these museums to see these specimens and these collections that have some importance. Um, and so this past year, uh, my master's student and I went to uh, Paris, and we went to Prague in the Czech Republic to see and take notes and study uh, a lot of these jewel beetles. And oftentimes we do field work as well, where we go and the whole point is to collect 
And you might wonder, well, why do you have to go to collect these things? Is it bad for populations or, or what's the point? And that's to, you know, a lot of our habitats are, are dwindling. And uh, a lot of us want to go and capture what biodiversity we currently have before it's gone, because there are species that are going extinct every day that we never even knew existed. Wow. And so a handful of us try to go and sample the biodiversity so at least we know. Um, and that's because without knowing what we're losing, we can't really make satisfactory arguments of, of the importance of biodiversity conservation. So it's kind of counterintuitive to collect biodiversity to preserve it, but that's sort of how it can work sometimes. Yeah. And then, you know, the second part is to grow our collections and resources here. How big is the collection at the uh, museum? Yeah, so the collection here uh, has had has had an interesting an interesting history, and it's about a million specimens. What? Yeah, so we it's called the LSAM or the Louisiana okay. State Arthropod Museum, and it actually started in in eighteen eighty nine. So it's it's old, um, and that was before LSU was LSU. LSU was an experimental agricultural station, uh, and the original LSU wasn't even here in Baton Rouge. Um, but it, the collection burned down completely in 1921. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So from 1920s until like the early 1960s, most of the research scientists, the faculty and staff at LSU had their own little tiny collections for their research purposes. Uh, and then in 1964 or 60, early 60s, um, the Department of Entomology hired their first director of the collection, and her name is Joan Chapin. And she spent 30 years at LSU, and she worked on ladybugs, ladybird beetles. Cool. Um, and she grew the collection from nothing to about 200,000 specimens just from the work of LSU scientists. Wow. Um, and it was, I should say that it was, it was largely helped by a couple of people that made frequent and large donations of their specimens, insects that they collect. Um, there are the Louisiana natives right here near us. Uh, there's there's an individual named Vernon Brew who actually has set the Guinness Book of World Records for consecutive nights of insect collecting. Really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and he, he's in Abita Springs and he has been super generous and donated lots of insects to our museum. Um, so how do you I do have a question. Sure. How do you pin the insects in the in y'all's museum, like in y'all's collections? How do you preserve them like that for so long? Yeah, that's a good question. So people think, well, you know, something dies, it rots, right? Yeah. Well, that's what makes an insect an insect is that they have an exoskeleton. So all their organs, all the gooey bits are inside their shell. And so think of like an egg, right? Uh the external eggshell will always remain. What's inside, now that's the stinky part that you don't want to crack open. Um, so yeah, so insects, usually all the internal squishy bits, they dry up. And so you pin an insect and it's like pinning through a hard shell and they just stay like that. Um, some of them can like discolor if they've got pigments, but a lot of them that have a uh, structural color don't ever discolor. And that's so they incredible. can be yeah, we've got specimens in our collection from the from the 1800s. Um, That's just crazy. And, you know, Those yeah. could be some of the first ones we we um, show on Instagram. I want to show some people that stuff on the Ag Center's Instagram. I think that'd be yeah. Really cool. We'll do a whole bunch of games where I can we can have people guess like guess the age of this, and I'll I'll trick them. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, Austin has a question for you. He says, what are some techniques that are used to encourage biodiversity? Are there efforts being made to protect these environments or is the focus more on collecting what you can while it's there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and that's hard. You know, I remember one time we were in we were in uh, Madagascar and Madagascar is a, is a magical place because the vast majority of life on that island uh, only lived there. It's like 80% of the species in Madagascar are only found there. Um, and so when we deforest Madagascar, it's gone and it's gone for forever. And so we were there, I remember we were with a group and, and one of our colleagues was trying to explain to, to um, one of our contacts there that like, yeah, look, you, you guys need to be planting 
trees of different types. And, and the hard part was um, we were never going to, that was never going to be successful because the people there needed to eat and they didn't need to eat in five years. They needed to eat tomorrow. Sure. And so they were cutting down their, their trees to plant rice fields because they needed to eat. So it's really sort of an interesting problem. It's, it's a global problem. It's about, it's this complex issue of um, human quality of life. It's this, it's this complex issue of, yeah, it's easy for us in a you know, first world country to say, yeah, we should be planting a diversity of, of plants and crops and habitats. And, and but we're not starving, right? Right, right. But we have the luxury and the privilege to say that. And so a lot of it comes down to education on a broad scale. Um, educating people about the importance of this and having more of a global a collaborative initiative to um, do what we can so that we can focus on uh, areas that a lot of people would see as more minor, like preservation of a forest in Madagascar because there's this weird little lemur. So, yeah, it's, it's a hard one. Um, but we will. We will work often with foresters or uh, local um, organizations to teach them at least a little bit more about what they have uh, so that they can collect and start documenting their own biodiversity uh, so it's not as much uh, just go in and, and collect everything and get out. So Makes sense. Thanks, Austin, for the good questions. Um, do you have anything else you want to add? We'll wrap up soon, but like, do you want to add any resources or anything more about your research? Because it's fascinating. It's really cool. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, you know, you asked me how many specimens. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll just f finish that thought. So after Dr. Chapin retired, Dr. Carlton, Chris Carlton came on uh, in the early 90s, and he took the collection from 200,000 specimens to a million, which is crazy. That's a lot. Uh, mostly because, uh, to reference an earlier question, he does a lot of litter sifting, and he works on little tiny, tiny beetles that are very diverse that live again, right beneath your feet. Um, and, uh, and then he retired and I am the, now the, the, the next person in line. Um, but throughout that whole time, one of the best resources is we've had, the collection has had one curator this, this whole time. And her name is Victoria Bayless and she's been here for 30, 32, 30, 31, 30 plus years. Um, and she's the state identifier. So oftentimes when anyone sends in a sample, uh, it goes to her and uh, sometimes they go to me uh, just depends on what the schedule is like that day or, or what the insect is but but uh, uh, and I supplied I think I gave you her content info as well yeah, um, did. she is she is one of the the resources our department has for identifying a lot of the insects that you may have questions about that's awesome yeah I know that I think you and I talked about it earlier but like once this ends we can get together and uh, film a video on how to basically um, Take nice pictures of, of samples for for them for everyone. Sure. Then. Definitely, yeah. Because you know, a lot of people send us pictures. I get pictures from my friends and family every day. What is this book, right? <laughs> sure. um, we don't know, but um, there are a few things we could point out that would make the the ability for us to look at an image and tell what it is a lot better. Like throw in something for scale because you zoom in on a bug. I have no idea if it's a millimeter or it's ten millimeter big. feet. Right. So a few things like that we can talk about on, on best practices to help us get you an accurate answer quickly. We'll make a video on that. Yeah. Sure. But um, is there anything else you want to wrap up with? I appreciate you being here. I think it's been really cool and interesting. And I think people really, really liked it. They learned a lot. Yeah. No, happy to do it. And uh, I don't think so. I think that's unless other anyone has any last minute questions. That's that's uh, that's all I got. That's awesome. Um, again, guys, uh, go to the LSU Ag Center Instagram. It's just at LSU Ag Center. And uh, y'all y'all check it out because we're going to be putting up some really cool photos from, from the museum. And we're going to do some identification things on it. Um, Megan's asking, hey, Nathan, could you briefly talk about maintaining the collection, keeping our pests and whatnot for people interested in keeping their own? Yeah, that that is a good point, Megan. So. If you are to collect insects and put them in a box, you do need to know that although your insects might not rot, um, other things will want to eat it. 
And so if any of you guys have dogs in the house, if any of you guys have uh, are, are hunters and have taxidermied animals in the house, uh, what you might occasionally find, usually in your windowsills or in your vacuum, you know, when you dump out your vacuum canister or bag, is you might find these little tiny round sort of colorful beetles. Or you might find these little skins that have a bunch of little spikes. And those are a specific type of beetle called a dermethid beetle. And those beetles eat organic matter. And so they will eat the clumps of dog hair under your couch. And they will get on your taxidermy deer and start to eat the hide if you're not careful. Um, and those are the biggest pests we have to deal with is that they will get in and they will eat your insects. And they essentially bore in, eat it, and it falls apart. And you're left with a pile of powder underneath your pin that used to be your nice insect. So the best thing that I can say is if you're going to keep your own collection, put it in a very tight sealing box. And if you really want to preserve it, uh, keep it in colder temperatures. Uh, there are chemicals we can use, but we try not to like mothballs. Uh, naphthalene crystals is a deterrent. It doesn't kill pests, but it will keep them out. We want to make a little a little box of naphthalene mothball crystals will, will help. But keep, keep it in a cool, protected place. Check on it. Make sure you don't see any signs of damage and try to get a tight sealing box. And if anyone really wants to know, uh, I can provide some links of where you can get a proper insect drawer that is made for this purpose that seals very tightly to display all your insects in. So. Oh, and if you want to plug your, um, your Twitter. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have a Twitter account. It's at Lord Lab underscore LSU. And that's mostly the Twitter account of my lab where I, I post, uh, you know, pub papers we publish or interesting studies that I find or just weird stuff about insects. So yeah, yeah, definitely check that out. And um, I believe you know this man. I do. That's Dr. Diaz. <laughs> that's yeah. Dr. Diaz. Yeah, Dr. Diaz is a faculty member here in the department and he does biocontrol, which is essentially using insects to fight pests. Um, and they can be pest insects, they can be pest plants. And so rather than resort to, to chemicals, to toxins and pesticides, uh, we use the insects to work for us. And so he, he and his group work on uh, most, a lot of them are, are very tiny wasps, but some are beetles too, that we intentionally, not me, he, intentionally can introduce to eat pests that aren't normally from Louisiana or from the United States. So it's pretty cool. That's really cool. Get, come on, we talk about that. Dr. Diaz, we're going to get you on a Facebook Live. And if not, we're going to create some videos together too. Yeah. <laughs> and Allison, you're saying, I wish I could have seen this earlier. Sounds like it was a great lecture. Don't worry about it because it's going to be posted afterwards. So y'all can watch the video anytime you want to. We've actually gotten a few questions about that. Like, oh, no, if we don't catch it live, we missed it. Don't worry about it. It's always posted to the Ag Center's page, Facebook page, and you can actually go to videos and it's going to be under videos. So you can watch all the different Live at Five sessions we've done. And even if you don't have a Facebook account, it's a public page. So anyone can watch this video. So y'all make sure to do that because um, if, if you're not live, it's OK. But if you're live, you get to actually ask questions and we might get to your questions. So that's the fun part of live. But um, I just want to say thanks again, Nathan, for being here. I learned a lot, too. I appreciate that. Sure, um, yeah, thank you. But, thank you for me. But, oh, I'm sorry. What were you saying? Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. I'm glad to have you. And again, y'all, check out our Instagram because we're going to be posting some really cool stuff from the museum. And uh, I'm excited to do that and make, make some quizzes out of it, dif do different things, um, insect ID. So anyways, y'all have a good one. Stay safe out there. And we'll see you next Monday for a backyard plant propagation session with Bob Mirabello, instructor in the horticulture department for the Ag Center. And he will be in his backyard walking around talking about plants, talking about what you can propagate. So y'all check us out on Monday. Y'all have a good one. Bye guys.